Please be seated. I want all those that are young at heart, especially the children, to come up at this time. Come on, kids. Come on, Scarlett, Colin, Carter, Colin, Brendan. <laughs> come on, Lexi. Come on, Scarlett. Come on, Nora, William, Logan, William, Colin. This is great, you know, we got, they got, listen to this, we have two Scarlets, two Scarlets, two Collins, and two Williams. Isn't that cool? That's pretty special, isn't it? Okay, how are y'all doing today? Anybody, Colin, how are you doing? You're way over there, I see you over there. Colin, do you know the book about Pinocchio? You know the story about Pinocchio? Yeah, okay. Pinocchio, who knows the story about Pinocchio? Any of y'all know the story of Pinocchio? Okay. All right, who's in the... Who, well, we're just losing people. They're going all over the place. All right, who are the characters in Pinocchio? Who, who are the characters in Pinocchio? Anybody? Jiminy Cricket? Alex? Pinocchio? That was an easy one, wasn't it? Okay. Huh? Felix? Uh, what else? Who else? The, the blue fairy. And what about Geppetto, right? And was, who was the character? The fox? What was the fox's name? Okay, that, this is a, that's the Disney version, but we'll go with that, okay? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Pinocchio was what? Hey, Logan. What was Pinocchio? He was a puppet, wasn't he? Hey, come here, Logan. Come here. Act like a puppet. I'm going to go like this. Go look. Okay, good. All right, go sit down. All right, now, Pinocchio was a puppet, but Geppetto made him and asked a special request, and the blue fairy granted his request and made Puppio, P Pinocchio a real person, right? And then what did Pinocchio do? Did he listen to Geppetto and do everything Geppetto told him? No, he went off, and what happened? The first thing that happened to him, what happened? Was, no, I think it was the nose first, wasn't it? He grew his nose long, and why does his nose get long? Because he lied. He told lies all the time. He wasn't truthful, was he? And then the second thing that happened, he went off and he got imprisoned, right? He got imprisoned. And then, then he went off and messed around with bad people, and that was when he got donkey ears, right? Okay. Jesus is on the holy mountain in today's lesson. This is the last epiphany. This is uh, the beginning of Lent. It's Wednesday. And so we leave behind Epiphany. Epiphany is a season of light. Light. Look here, Logan. Light. Go like this. Everybody go like this. Everybody, light, light. Let there be light, okay? Light, 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 light. And Epiphany is a season of light when it becomes obvious to those people that pay attention to the light. Let's do some light, Nora. Nora, Nora, come here. Come, to, come over here. Come over here. Come over here. Come over here. Pick up Anna and walk around with her, will you? Okay. All right, here we go, Nora. Listen, light. She was scared of that light. Some people are scared of the light. That happens sometimes. You want a stamp? Wait, hold on. You want a stamp too, don't you? Come on, get a stamp. We're going to have a stamp of light on it. I'll do the rest of the children's sermon another time. Okay. All right, here we go. Jesus wants his boys to do the right thing and listen to him. God says, listen to Jesus. Don't be like Japan. Pinocchio and not listen to Geppetto, listen to Jesus. Okay? Logan, Logan, you're a mess. You don't want one? Okay, you don't have to have one. Nora, you want one? Okay. Nora, you want a stamp? Scarlett, you want a stamp? No, you don't want a stamp. Nora, don't want one. William, you want one? Carter, you want a stamp? Yeah. You do or don't? You do. Of course you do. There you go. Father, make us the masters of ourselves that we might become the servants of others. Take our minds and think with them. Take our lips and speak through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Good morning, church. Good morning. Y'all thought I forgot, didn't you? I did forget the first service, and so I thought, well, that's a good segue, because we often forget, right? We forget. We think, do y'all forget? Anybody, any of y'all forget things? The older you get, the more you'll forget. You trust me on this. It's a hard thing to remember, and uh, we get busy with our lives. We start doing things, and things come in that we don't expect, and we have to deal with it, and the next thing we know, we realize we've forgotten something. The last minute, you say, oh, you're halfway down the road. I forgot, you know? And that's a hard thing, isn't it? It's a hard thing to deal with if you do it often. In the days uh, preceding today, uh, uh, I was listening to the radio, and I heard this story about a doctor who was a cancer doctor, I believe, and he uh, was telling about how doctors become real adept at being evasive when someone says, how much time do I have left, or something like that, right? And they, they weave a story around, and, and the idea is we want you to always have hope, right? And one day he decided he was going to change his technique, and he was going to tell the truth to one of his patients. Imagine that. You know, you pay somebody a lot of money for their services and they don't tell you the truth. That seems like politics, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> and, and so he says, he goes to the patient and the patient says, Doc, is this the end? Or something like that. And the doctor says, yes, you need to get your affairs in order. That's code language for the clock is ticking, right? Now, we're all going to die, right? We all, we all know that, don't you? Anybody believe they're not going to die? Okay, good. So we're clear on that. We all know that, and it's going to happen. We just don't want it to happen today, right, or in 10 minutes from now. We, we hope that we have plenty of time left, and perhaps if we eat right and we do all the right things, we can prolong it a little bit longer. But Jesus knew he was going to die in this story today. He knew he was gone. He was on the way to the cross. He took his boys up on the mountain, right? And uh, the, while they were there, he took the three hardest ones of the group, James and John, the sons of thunder, they called them, right? And I was going to tell this to the kids, you know, the, what happens when, what precedes thunder? Anybody shout it out. Okay, lightning. And what does lightning look like? Bright light, right? Sometimes it'll just fill the sky with light. And these are the sons of lightning. And then there was Peter, the rock, who was always first in line. And Jesus took them up there for a reason. He wanted to teach them something because he knew he was about to die. This doctor says, when he asked the patient, when the patient asked and he told him the truth, yes, get your affairs in order, an astounding thing happened. The doctor said, the patient reacted so differently than what he anticipated all those years when he didn't tell the truth. He had a peace about him, just peace, just calm. And then he said something extraordinary began to happen. The first thing was he began to think of people that he needed forgiveness from. He wanted forgiveness. And after a while of talking about that, and they continued to meet until the day he died, he began to talk about how he wanted to make sure that he's, his life had, had a purpose, that he had some purpose and he had fulfilled that purpose, that his life meant something. And then after a while, the third thing happened, the man said to him, will they remember me? Will they remember me? Will you remember me? Jesus was hoping that that was the case for him. He was preparing his boys over and over again and telling them what was going to happen next. And there is going to be a lot of turmoil. And you, you're going to be surrounded by people that are not going to like you because of your belief in me. So take heart. Be at peace. Don't be afraid. I'll give you the words you need. He gave him lots of information. He said, remember this. Remember these words. 
And I'm here to fulfill God's purpose, and that purpose is that you'll have joy, and that the joy that I have, you'll have in spades. Jesus is about to die. And he takes his boys up and shows them something extraordinary. M Moses and Elijah join him in the, the sky, I guess, or on the mountain. Uh, it's reminiscent of the story we read about Moses today. And Elijah and Moses have been dead for hundreds, even a thousand years, right? And here they were on the mountain and they're seeing them and they knew who they were. I suppose the conversation gave them a clue. But there wasn't any pictures back then of Moses and Elijah. No paintings. But they knew the stories because they had been told over and over again. And there they were together and something extraordinary happened. There was a transfiguration. A different than a transformation. You know, you, you have a, a kid that's uh, not doing well in school and all of a sudden they meet some teacher that's really good and they start doing well and you say he's had a transformation, right? But this was different. His body, face, facial appearance, everything was transfigured. And all of a sudden, he looked different. And he looked like light with a face attached. Wow. What would, you, what would you do if you saw something like that? Would you remember it? Would you remember this extraordinary event? Sure you would, wouldn't you? You wouldn't forget and yet it tells us in the story that Peter immediately, impetuous Peter, he wants to build three booths. You know what? Let's have us an arcade here. Let's get us a few booths up. We can sell some Jesus dolls, some Elijah dolls, some Moses dolls. And you're not getting it. You're not getting this. This is about the rest of eternity. I'm preparing you for that. And so they leave the mountain. They go down. You know the story. You can't always stay on the mountain. This was a mountaintop experience, and they head down the hill, and the first thing that happens is they're confronted by great crowds. That was not unusual for Jesus. But in this story, we hear that a man comes to Jesus, and he's got a son, and the son is demon-possessed. Now, all of us that are parents know that syndrome, right? We've all had <laughs> children that had demons possessing them. But in this story, this is a real honest-to-goodness demon, and it was taking this child and throwing him on the ground, and and Jesus said, what? And they said, well, we got your boys. We asked them if they would take care of this for us, and they couldn't do it. And then Jesus says this extraordinary thing. He starts talking about this perverse generation, right? Did y'all forget? Did you boys forget? Did you forget what you just saw? You could have taken care of this. But they forgot. We come here every Sunday, right? I mean, some of us do. We come here and we're looking for something. And all of you that are here today, you're here for a reason. You have some pressing need, maybe, that you say, I'm going to go to church this Sunday. And maybe it's not so pressing. Maybe it's just something out of habit you've done over and over again your whole life. But I believe that we all come here, we're looking for something, some bit of grace that can help us when we go out there, right? Right? Some bit of grace, some little spark of light that will live with us when we go out there. So if, if this is important, this experience, then it's important only in how it enables us to spend the rest of our week. Right? That we don't forget. That somehow we become heathens once we leave this door. And I know that's true of some of you. Okay. So it counts what we do after this. And that's what Jesus is saying to his boys. What happens after this is important. The story of Pinocchio grabbed me this week and I couldn't let go of it. And I read it, I've seen it, I've seen the movie, the Disney version, of course. There was a book written back in the 1890s, I think, uh, that was a series of books, actually, and it didn't turn out so well. But Pinocchio uh, didn't end up good. I mean, he had his feet burned off at one point. And uh, yet, we get the Disney version. And we like the Disney version, don't we? We like everything sort of soft, soft and pleasant, you know. <laughs> when you wish upon a star, 
makes no difference where you are. It's all going to turn out good, right? The blue fairy is going to come up and straighten it all out. And the blue fairy did come in the story and made Pinocchio right. Just right. Just perfect for Geppetto. And Geppetto loved Pinocchio, but that wasn't enough. And the blue fairy gives some instructions to Pinocchio. It says, I want you to be brave. And I want you to be truthful. You know, Jesus said things like this. And I want you to be unselfish. Jesus said, uh, fear not, right? Don't be afraid. I'm going to give you the words you need when these people confront you. He said, fear not more than he said anything else. We like to latch on to some issue that we think is really important. But really, Jesus was about telling us to be at peace. Peace with who you are, peace with the people around you, be peace with God, be brave. And then Jesus says, follow me. I'm the truth. The truth shall set you free. And then did he ever say anything about being unselfish? He's going to die on the cross. He tells over and over again to the disciples, if you save your life, you'll lose it. If you give your life up for my sake, you'll find it. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. All of those things are witness to being unselfish. And yet, Pinocchio forgot. He forgot. He lied. His nose grew long. He acted like a donkey, and so he grew donkey ears. I was paying attention to the way people were seated in the early service. There was a bunch of people over here, then there were a bunch of people back there not as many as over here, and then there was a few people up here. And I thought, when I saw it, I said, oh, that reminds me of the caucuses I saw the other night. Did you all see that? You know, and you, you'd say, well, these people right here, there's only a few up here, they're not viable, right? Because I, I learned all about the caucuses. And these people, they're really proud of their candidate over there. There's a lot of people over there. A lot of people back there, they kind of like their candidates. And, and I watched and I listened to the people coming in and out, the interviews, they could have flipped a coin and done as good, right? I mean, do you, you pay any attention to it? I was watching, Sunday night's really important for me. It, it's the one night of the week where I'm finished with everyone except for my wife, and we watch our favorite shows. We watch Madam Secretary, and we watch uh, The Good Wife. And I, and I know, I'm not promoting those shows. They're both really political, though, and in the... Good wife the other night, Peter Flork, was running for president. He's a fictional character who's the good wife's husband. That's the governor of Illinois. And he's going to Iowa for the caucuses, and he's going to do the full Grassley. Some of y'all see this show, the full Grassley. It's about the senator from Iowa that uh, made sure he goes to every county in the state during the primary to the caucuses, the caucuses. And Peter Flores is going to do that. And every stop, his campaign manager says, now when you get there, you be kind to the people and say a few good words, but always eat one of those loose meat sandwiches, right? Because they're famous for that in Iowa, evidently. Anybody from Iowa here? I'm not dissing your loose meat sandwiches, but it doesn't sound like gourmet food, you know? I mean, I, and, and so he goes and he eats one of these sandwiches at every stop. And they're on the bus and they're going, they stop, they eat again. Lots of tension here, lots of emotion. He goes to the last stop and he takes a bite out of the sandwich and he can't hold it. He has to go find a garbage can. And all of this is recorded. Come caucus time, he goes into the room and sure enough, his group looks more like the acolytes over here, you know. And he doesn't have enough to be viable. And it's all because he didn't hold that sandwich down. Now, is that fickle or what? I mean, can you trust anything when all that matters is whether or not you eat the sandwich or not? I mean, that's not a really good criteria for politics, is it? I mean, you wouldn't think, I'm going to judge my camp boat on whoever eats the most of my cooking. And yet, it's come to that, I'm afraid. We've forgotten, haven't we? We've lost our way. That's why we have Lent. That's why we prepare for Easter. We get together. We do these things so that we might not forget. Just like 
Moses told the people in the wilderness, don't forget this stuff. That's, you know, that's another story we read today, isn't it? We read the story about how Moses comes down from the mountain. Remember the mountaintop experience Jesus and the boys just experienced? Now we're coming down with Moses, and he's got the tablets of stone. And this time, these people at least remember what happened to him when they had the golden calf, you know. So they're paying attention now. And when he comes down, he's got this glow about it. He's been transfigured. And the light is shining from him like a beacon coming out. And they see the glory of God in his face. And he knows. He knows instinctively. If I don't cover my face, they're going to be dead. There's something going to happen to them that's not going to be good. Because they're afraid already. And so he puts a veil over his face. And it says in the story, we read it in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And we read about it in the story in, in Exodus. Where Moses covers his face with a veil and we know that even today in the synagogues there's a veil we've lost one <laughs> he forgot if you saw that experience with Moses right you already experienced the golden calf and now you see again you see Moses and he's bright and shiny as the sun would you forget would you forget I mean, these people actually saw it. They lived with him. They, they, they revered this man. They argued with him. They tried to go back to Egypt. But, but they saw this face, and they saw something different, and they knew, we better pay attention to this. We better make sure this is important and tell it to our friends and our family. And I mean, they'd be knocking on doors, don't you think? They'd go out, and they'd say, hey, I know you didn't see this, but let me tell you, Moses is bright and shiny as the sun. It's amazing. Wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you do that if you had an experience like that? And yet we come in here on Sunday morning sometimes and we have those experiences and we forget. We forget. The people of Israel forgot. If you pay attention to the story, they go on, they conquer the land, they're given in this land of milk and honey that they were promised to Abraham. And when they get there, almost immediately they start fighting among themselves and fighting among anybody that will fight with them. They forgot. They'd been given this great gift, this great vision, and they forgot. That's our story. That's why we come together. We come together every Sunday so that we can receive grace and so we can go out into the world and let that grace shine for others so that they might find their way home. Because that's the story of Jesus. Jesus comes to earth to live and die for us, to be a guide to guide us. God has sent guides for the whole salvation story and now he sends Jesus and Jesus says, listen to me. That's what the voice said on the mountaintop. This is my son, my chosen. I chose him. Listen to him because he has the keys to eternal life. He's the one that's going to get you there. Trust in him. Not in a meat sandwich. Don't do that. And be brave. Don't be afraid. God says, I will be with you to the end of the, the age in Matthew's gospel. And be truthful. Tell the truth in love. Jesus says, I'm the truth. Talk about me and you'll be safe in the truth. And Jesus says, love one another. That's the truth. And whatever you do, be unselfish. Let your life be a guide for others that they might find that peace that passes understanding and live in to the vision that God has for us that we might have a purpose in our lives, that we might know that we're forgiven and that we will be remembered to the end of the age. And that's good news. Those with ears to hear, let them hear.